Welcome everyone to the Coin Brief Podcast. This is episode number 17 of the podcast. Every week we talked about the late we talk about the latest news and developments in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space. And um, yeah, it's been a little bit of a slow news week, but uh, let's let's get started into some of the some of the more important and prominent stories that have happened so far uh, in this week of late September 2014. PayPal has this like, I think it's called like the payment hub and it's for like, I guess it's for merchants and um, it's, I don't know exactly what it does, oh. but they, they've integrated it into that system and so any merchant that uses uh, PayPal pay hub can accept Bitcoin. Gotcha. I think, um, I think it's only for digital goods, like only for, you know, music files, um, like oh, okay. digital video games and stuff like that. It seems like PayPal is, 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 um, keeping to their word pretty much when they said that this, that like the, the brain tree thing was their first foray into Bitcoin. Yeah. And now this comes out like within two weeks. And so they're moving pretty quickly. I think, you know, I think there's a good chance that we can see them actually integrate Bitcoin within, you know, PayPal itself. Uh, you know, I like I, my previous estimate was within like maybe a year. But, you know, with how quickly they're moving, you could see it within within a few months, maybe that'd be that'd be um, crazy. What exactly? Like I don't, I've never used PayPal. So, like, what exactly would you send money to PayPal for? Like, don't they make all their money from like transaction fees? Yeah, that's one way. I'm. Mean, they probably have other sources of revenue as well. Like, like, what could you actually buy from PayPal Bitcoin if they, you know, accepted it themselves and not just integrated it in their payment hub? Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, like, well. If they accepted Bitcoin themselves, then that would mean that every place that already accepts PayPal payments would then accept Bitcoin through PayPal. So that would mean that you would be able to buy stuff on eBay, for instance, with Bitcoin. Okay. Which, you know, hasn't happened yet. And the way that some, you know, news outlets cover these PayPal stories, you, they make it seem almost that PayPal itself is accepting Bitcoin. And it's not. It's that might be in the pipeline, but it's not happening yet. Yeah. Still don't know exactly what this payment hub is. What your co oh, it, you're right. It's digital content with PayPal. They can use PayPal to buy digital content with their phone, credit card, or other popular payment types. Blah blah blah. Yeah, it seems like any place that ex that allows you to put place a charge on like your phone bill, um, I mean, that's basically having the phone company act as a payment processor. Then the phone company pays the merchant. Like if you're if yeah. the merchant already agreed to that, there's literally no reason why they wouldn't also accept Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, I imagine, way better than that as as than going through the phone company. Yeah. And, um, you know, like, as a direct result, the price went up, of Bitcoin went up to 450 So, you know, that's pretty cool. Oh, from the PayPal thing? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that that was what caused it. Why would I, that cause it, but then the other PayPal thing didn't cause it two weeks ago? Or any of well, the other crazy positive news? Because people have been anticipating PayPal for a very long time. Braintree is like nobody. Like there's not like nobody even knows what Braintree is. Right. Um after like ever since Overstock accepted Bitcoin pretty much, people have been like waiting for PayPal to accept Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So once they made this announcement that, you know, they were like kinda halfway accepting Bitcoin with their through their payments hub. They got people really excited. Like the story was on the top of the Bitcoin subreddit for like three days. Yes. Uh, yes. So. But there's a yeah. lot of stuff that's on top of the Bitcoin subreddit for multiple days at a time, and they don't mean crap, you know. 
Like they'll they'll I've... they'll vote up memes and pictures of Coke bottles with the word Satoshi on it. The yeah. last thing the last thing I saw on top of the Bitcoin subreddit that was up there for more than a day was that thing about Apple Pay, and that's because the fappening was like still going on. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the Jennifer Lawrence meme thing. Yeah, yeah, but no, it like it happened like the price went up like started going up literally like an hour after the news I got reported on. So you know that's that's generally how long it takes for the price to react to news because you know it takes a little effort to circulate throughout the community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um. And so you're yeah, saying it, that maybe someone heard that news and they're like, well, now that I can pay for my digital content in Bitcoin, I might as well invest thousands of dollars into Bitcoin. Um, well, I mean, it's the same reason why uh, Bitcoin shot up 40 bucks when Dish started accepting. People, mm. people are watching it and they're skeptical about it. And they're like, well, I just need this one thing that makes it seem really legitimate to me. And then I'll put some money into it, mm. and that hap- and you know, and then it happens, and they're like, "Well, let me put some money into it," because oh, PayPal accepts it. PayPal is a very legitimate business, so maybe Bitcoin might go somewhere. Mm. Uh, you know, it's the price when merchants or when businesses accept Bitcoin and the price goes up. It's not because people ha- now have a new place to spend their Bitcoin. It's because potential investors who are skeptical have become convinced enough of its legitimacy to put some money into it gotcha okay so that was kind of like the like the straw that broke the camel's back of this yeah. particular investor is like okay you know that that pushed me over the edge i'll invest now yeah because paypal bitcoin community has been talking about paypal um you know at least since i started you know hanging around and i'm sure you know before then so it's this is like really you know, hyped up news is like people were anticipating this for a long time. So, okay. and when I saw it, when I saw that it went up, I was like, I was like, uh, th- you know, this is ba- this is merchant adoption. So there's not really like any solid reason for the price to go up because of that. So it'll be back to 400 within a week, and it's back at 400. Yeah, so. yeah, because we still have that overall selling pressure that yeah. we talked about last week. Yeah. Swedish central bank says that Bitcoin hasn't affected the economy. Hasn't affected the economy? Yeah. <laughs> oh, it hasn't. Okay. okay, that's what the headline says, but the article says that it hasn't affected the stability of Sweden's economy. Huh. Interesting conclusion for a report to reach. Like, you would think that they would come out with a report if it was affecting the economy. But like there, someone, someone in the government was like, "Hey, this digital currency thing. Should we find out if this is having an impact on our own country?" <laughs> and I do report. Oh no, it's not. Oh, no we need ran to worry. some numbers. It's not. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get back were, to you guys in a year and let you know then if it's changed. Maybe they were looking at it from like the perspective of the disruption factor of Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, like, yeah, is, it could. Is this threatening our traditional financial systems? Mm. Yeah. I, you know, I subscribe to the philosophy that I don't think that it's going to um, disrupt as much as some people think it will. Like, there's there's plenty of room in the industry for you know both sides, legacy financial systems as well as Bitcoin and digital currencies. Um, like there's a lot of, I think the majority of Americans are comfortable with like their current credit card and banking system. Um, they don't realize the flaws of fiat money, um, you know, and, and, and inflation. I think, I think it can coexist to a certain extent because, as you know, if, if Bitcoin ends up, not Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, you know, any cryptocurrency ends up like reaching its, the full potential like visionary ideal of becoming a world currency that eliminates the need for banks and credit cards and all this stuff Mm -hmm. you know if that actually starts to happen then it's you know directly competing with like the largest special interest group in the world that basically has the, the government in their pocket yeah so it can like it can expand to the point where it like starts to directly compete with banks and then i think 
you know, there'll be like, you'll start to see like maybe some widespread bans or at least mm -hmm. lobbying attempts from banks to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you know, there's a good chance that we haven't even gotten to that phase yet. You know, we haven't reached the true like government hostility phase for it. Like we've seen some governments try and ban it like Ecuador banned, yeah. you know, digital currencies and stuff. But like, it's, it seems like the, the U S government is kind of playing patty cakes with it for now. You know, just doing some hearings and stuff and, you know, allowing certain states like New York to, to draft their own laws for it. Uh, they're they're kind of taking a wait-and-see approach. Um, well, you know, yeah. the, I would say the U.S. isn't as worried about it as some other countries, uh, especially developing countries, because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the dollar is way stronger... Uh, than, you know, like the Ecuadorian peso or whatever they use. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, Bitcoin, uh, in, order, in order for Bitcoin to beat the dollar, the dollar either has to hyperinflate or Bitcoin has to be used um, globally in an equal amount as the dollar, which is impossible because literally every single country in the world accepts the dollar. Uh, you know, like... The dollar replaced gold. You know, like gold used to be the international currency. Well, now the dollar is gold. So. Mm -hmm. And there's like a, a lot of politics involved in that, right? Like, um, you know, the dollar is is you the petrodollar, right? It's it's yeah, it's that's used what they for call oil it. and everything. Yeah. So there's oh so much entrenched interest there, and like Bitcoin is literally going up. You know, going up against the the most entrenched interests of the whole 20th century, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's <laughs> whew, uphill battle. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. I'm, you know, I doubt we'll see like digital currency, you know, beat fiat in our lifetimes. Mm. Yeah. You know, like <laughs> it's about as, it's about as likely as, you know, uh, going full anarcho-capitalist within the next 70 years like yeah no <laughs> it's probably just not gonna happen no. that's the kind of philosophy and you know societal system in like a total paradigm shift that doesn't happen you know overnight yeah. unless something yeah. unless something really really crazy happens like a world financial meltdown or something that totally throws everything into flux then you well, yeah who knows actually, what'll happen i actually forgot about that because you know i think that is a lot closer than a lot of people think because I I have this I kind of have this uh, hypothesis that the Great Depression never ended and because uh, you know every, every time ever since the Great Depression every time there's been a recession it, the central bank has the Fed has just uh, tried to smooth it out by pumping like tons of money into the system so mm. Uh, there was never any like real recovery after the Great Depression. Um, because everybody says it ended at World War II, but that's because uh, the entire economy shifted to war production. Yeah. And the government, you know, basically inflated the currency like crazy, making tanks and stuff. Um, and then ever since then, you know, about every you know, fifteen to twenty years, there's been a recession, and the government has just like inflated their way out of it. Interesting. So, the past what is it, like 80 years has been uh, just one giant bubble. And, um, so, and you know, the traditional Fed policies aren't working anymore. Like um, QE was like a very like extremely controversial and like radical mon or, uh, monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And they did it because 0% uh, because interest rates just weren't working anymore. Because that's what they normally use, right, to prop yeah, up the economy. They, yeah, they normally just um, they normally just buy up a bunch of bonds. They normally just buy up a bunch of government bonds, um, and that lowers interest rates and people and it injects more money into the economy. But that didn't work. People, you know, they were buying up bonds and interest rates were at zero, but banks still weren't lending out money. So then they they decided to buy government bonds in addition to that buy private bonds from 
the you know the banks themselves so directly give cash to the banks that's what qe is and that's not working or it's starting to work now because the dow's above seventeen thousand. so are those like two different work. types of inflation like they've invented a new type of inflation in addition to the type that they used to use in the 20th century and now they're doing yeah, like, both what they would do is that they would lower the interest rates to the fed would lower its interest rate to zero um on the the accounts that the individual banks had with the Fed, so the so the banks weren't getting anything on their deposits, and so they would make it'd be more profitable to lend more money out instead of uh, keep it in their deposit account with the with the Fed, and um, they did that, and they would uh, they would give short term loans to banks to keep them solvent. Uh, that was a huge source of the credit expansion, the Great Depression. Uh, Banks, you know, were having a hard time redeeming their uh, their gold certificates, and so, uh, um, you know, the Fed just like gave them like short term credit to shore up their insolvency, and then they would um, they would buy they would buy uh, treasury bonds on the secondary market uh, uh, from the public, and and that would uh, lower the interest rate of treasury bonds uh, which would encourage you know uh, more people to sell and then they could use you know use that give that to the banks to lend it out uh, but then like the like what they're doing now with QE is they're essentially just printing money and handing it to the banks because before they would you, they would buy government bonds in the secondary market and that was kinda like a roundabout way to inflate um, mm -hmm. But now they're just like they're buying bonds from private banks and they're literally creating money just out of thin air and just handing it to the banks to increase their their reserves. Wow. And that's you know that's worked so far because the Dow is you know at unprecedented highs right now. Yeah. So if you got money in the stock market, then you're doing well in most cases. Yeah. But most of the country uh, is still you know, feeling the effects of the recession um, that started in 2008. Like you mentioned that you don't think the Great Depression ever ended, uh, you know, in the in the 20th century. But like that, that's pretty controversial and, and you can make the case for that. But like, I, I would hope that at least, you know, most of the country would agree that the recession that start the Great Recession, as they call it, that started in 2008 is definitely like for sure not over like that's still you know oh yeah the economic landscape has fundamentally shifted and um the government has has a greater you know influence on this the banks still have all of their influence on the economy you know they're still too big to fail and um <laughs> i mean and, and well i think most I've, of the country is is treading water basically i personally think the the federal reserve is losing their control over the economy and that's why um you know, and that's why a big crash is, you know, maybe within the next, you know, 20 or 30 years because uh, the the Fed has to, you know, rely on this crazy policy of just like literally, you know, printing money and handing it to banks for free just to get the stock market up. Mm. Uh, and uh, I actually, I looked up quantitative easing just on Investopedia just now and what they, what they would do previously before qu what they do when they're not when they're expanding the monetary supply without quantitative easing is, like I said, they bought securities, uh, government government bonds from the secondary market, um, but that was from individuals. So they would just like they would give money to individuals, which they would then put into the stock market. Uh, but now they're giving money to banks, so banks can loan it out to you know everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to put it, it's, it like it increases the money supply much faster than just buying uh, government bonds from individuals. That's that's the difference. And so all these banks are just sitting on these gigantic piles of cash, and you know the government is trying to encourage them to lend it out, but the banks don't want to do anything that they absolutely don't have to yeah. because they are profit driven. They want to keep yeah, that, that was, money. That was one of the big problems with the bank balance, right? Like the the federal government. Gave the banks, you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars, and 
with the um you know on the expectation that they would loan it out and stimulate spending but then they just sat on it cuz yeah. they like they didn't want to you know fail again the secret goldman sachs tapes um some federal reserve employee recorded you know banker conversations at goldman sachs for 47 hours and um and you know they they the overall conclusion i like i haven't read the i i haven't read like the full transcript of the of this american life their story they did on it and i haven't read the i haven't listened to the tape either but like it seems like the overall gist of it is the federal reserve like has you know practically no input or or oversight whatsoever on the big banks like they have people who work there as you know people who are supposed to regulate the banks but they don't speak their mind they don't um bring up issues that they see in terms of volatility or risks that the bank is taking they just like they don't they don't do what you know most of the american public thinks that they're supposed to do they didn't have any control over the banks because the fed made their employees be so secretive about everything that just nothing ever got done <laughs> yeah yeah um uh should we talk about that should we do that in the podcast or is it not really not really crypto related mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, oh man, the Fed sucks, the big banks suck. Yeah, I wouldn't really know what to say about it. I mean, because, I don't know, I thought it was pretty well known that the Fed doesn't really have any control over what the banks do in their daily operations. Pretty much all they can do is just, you know, influence uh, lending and you know lower interest rates and things like that, but they can't actually make the banks do anything. Mm. Like that's what I've always understood. Yeah, it's, but like they don't even they don't even like, like forget about making the banks do stuff. Like it's the job of the um, the advisor, the Fed advisor that is that is advising or overseeing that bank. It's their job to at least report to their superior in the Fed like of what the bank is doing like that's the whole reason they have like their own office their own desk with within the bank itself to know what's going on and report to the fed but like they don't even do that like they're discouraged from doing that um it's like it makes you wonder like is the is the fed even like actually dedicated to regulations or is it just like another is it just a puppet is it just an arm of the banks themselves? Because um, oh well, no, it definitely, it definitely is an arm of the banks. So you know, it was created by the banks in 1910. Uh, you know, there was a senator and then representatives from uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Chase Bank, and Kuhn Loeb, which is a big bank back in the day. Uh, representatives from those three banks and. Um, Senator, his last name is Aldridge, I can't remember his first name, they took a weekend vacation to this island off the coast of Georgia uh, secretly and wrote the Federal Reserve Act that ended up being passed in 1913. So, yeah, I mean, the Federal Reserve was created by banks. So, you know, of course, it's going to be controlled by the banks. <laughs> oh, man, so uh, why, why, do, why do so many... Americans and people who are supposed to be like well versed in politics and and news and stuff, they put, they spout the same like nonsense of this illusion that the that the Fed can can regulate the banks. Why why like if the Fed was created by them, it's an arm of them. It's you know an instrument used by them for their own ends, for their own goals and profit and self interest. Why? in the world would it do anything to you know to to go against them to hinder them like it's it's all for show it's all for show yep yeah i mean uh the banks the big banks in america in the 19th century the late 19th century they started the movement for the central bank you know they um 
they went and started all these conventions and hired all these economists to do all this, you know, research, shoddy research, and, um, like, you know, get public support for a central bank. And then they, like, took, all, took it to the government repeatedly. And they're like, we need a central bank, we need a central bank, we need a central bank. Um, and they did it. They did it to monopolize the banking industry in the United States because uh, Morgan Ch and Chase and the other big banks uh, were trying to become mon banking monopolies for a long time, but they couldn't because you know the free market just wouldn't let them. So they're like bank. So if the if the banks supported the creation of the Fed, uh, then why could we ever expect the Fed to do anything that the banks wouldn't like? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Just it's silly. People people need to kind of wake up and realize that uh, that the the government is not. Yeah, you know, like, it's a fantasy to think that the government can make the banks better. Yeah, it's um. You should read this uh this paper. Murray Rothbard wrote it. It's called The Origins of the Federal Reserve. It's like um. It's like a hundred pages. Like you could read it in a weekend. Like if you didn't have anything to do, you just sit down and read it. Um, and it's a really interesting. Like it's a really crazy history of how the Fed got started. Mm. Yeah, I sh I should read that and get kind of educated about this crap. This is not the kind of stuff that they teach you in schools. Yeah, and, not even uh, in colleges. <laughs> like what? Yeah, the hell? Mur and Murray Rothbard is a really. A really good writer. Like he, he's really easy to read. It's not like he's an economist, and uh, you know that's kind of about economics. But it's not all this like you know technical economic jargon. He just, mm. you know, he writes really clearly and concisely. So mm. the MIT students who created like a Bitcoin app for websites that like allowed um, allowed visitors to the website to like mine for Bitcoin or something, and uh, but. Like, the project never really got off the ground, but apparently they're getting sued by the New Jersey state. Because New Jersey, like, thinks that they were, like, hackers or something. And it's suing them for, like, all the Bitcoin addresses that were involved in that. And, um... Uh, what they... The app they developed would, um would allow websites to use their visitors' computers to mine Bitcoin. It's like when you when you got onto the website, it would like take control of your CPUs and mine Bitcoin. Gotcha. Okay. Hmm. So the the New Jersey government looks at that and they're like, Oh, these guys are hackers. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're gonna we're gonna take them down. But like they're they're students and they experimented and they created an app that never was actually used in the real world and never actually, you know, mined any Bitcoin, and they're getting sued in court yeah. over this. I, that's a that's a that's more of a affront to free speech than anything. Like people should be allowed to experiment and and create interesting apps as part of you know free expression. Uh, if they start using it to hurt other people then there's a justification uh, maybe for the government to come in and, you know, try and stop them. But, like, um, they didn't do anything. The New Jersey Attorney General said that this program was used on at least three websites that were uh, based in New Jersey. And really? that's, where, that's okay. where they got their justification to, you know, attack these students. Interesting. Okay, so it was used out in the wild. Allegedly. Allegedly. Okay. But, st yeah, I mean, still. Still. Um, I I'm looking at the Wired article. Uh, the mining tool known as Tidbit was developed in late 2013 by Ruben and his classmates for the Node Knockout Hackathon. Only Ruben is identified on the subpoena, but his three classmates are identified on the Hackathon website as Oliver Song, Kevin King, and Carolyn Zhang. The now defunct tool was designed to offer website visitors an alternative way to support the sites they visited by using their computers to mine bitcoins for them in exchange for having online ads removed. That's 
I mean, that's a pretty interesting implementation. Um, like, it, even if they tried to use it right now, I don't think, it, like, it just simply wouldn't work because regular computers aren't powerful enough to mine Bitcoin anyway now. So that wouldn't yeah. really work very well. You might as well just keep the ads on the website. <laughs> yeah, um, like, yeah. You, you can't even... It takes you like six hours just to mine one Satoshi now. So, on a on a computer. Holy crap! Is that true? On a regular I, computer? I did. I tried it. But I like. I didn't know anything about Bitcoin mining. I didn't know anything about you know difficulty or anything. This is like when I first started getting interested in having Bitcoin, and I was like, well, you know, I guess I can use my laptop to mine. Yeah. <laughs> and I ran it like all day, and. It took me like, it was actually more like three or four hours and I got a Satoshi. Nice. And it, it just, but it also bogged my laptop down so much that I couldn't use it for anything else. Like it sat there and it was this like, uh, it was some like online mining service, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One Satoshi. That's, what is this Satoshi again? Is that a millionth of a Bitcoin? Or it's a hundred the smallest. Million? Um, I don't know, but it's, it's the smallest division. Okay, yeah. It's either a millionth or, a, or like a ten millionth, um, which is, you know, like a, a, a thousandth of a cent. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah that's, a, that's a testament to how ridiculous yeah. the mining hashing power has gotten. I couldn't even put that in a wallet because it wasn't enough to pay the transaction fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, so hopefully these these MIT guys like I don't know, I feel like the school should um help defend them in court from this. Uh Yeah, like I don't know I don't know why New Jersey is saying that this is a bad thing though because it's not like it's malicious or anything. It's um, you know, it's just another way of, you know, making your website profitable cuz you know, when you go when you go on the website, by going onto the website, you accept terms of service you know just by you know typing the address in your into your browser and going there and so part of it is we can use a coin to help us stay afloat i mean the only time the only way it would become a problem is if they like um were able to stay inside your computer somehow and they continued to use it to mine bitcoins after you left then that would you know basically be theft of your you know electricity yeah, and you know, I I would I would hope that they would actually, uh, you know, seek people's permission to do that, or just or just put like a gigantic button on the on the corner, being like, would you, would you like to remove the ads on this site, and then in and instead you can use your computer CPU power to mine bitcoins for us, and it's just like a, you opt into it, uh, that would that would make sense, and like I'm not sure if that's the kind of the kind of implementation they used but like i think that th i think they did use that implementation in order to basically ask people uh if they want to look at ads or mine bitcoin um yeah so you know if people agree to that then what's what's the problem they're they're opting in there's no problem with it yeah and you know like it also wasn't even you know it, it was just like you know, the, a really intelligent equivalent of a science fair project. Like, you know, they didn't, they didn't, weren't making any money off of it. The, you know, the attorney general said that three, three whole websites somehow got a hold of this code. But, I mean, you know, that's, they didn't back that up with any evidence as far as I could tell. And I don't know. They just felt threatened by it. Yeah. The, the program never got beyond the proof of concept stage. Uh, before Rubin and Tidbit as an entity were hit with subpoenas by the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs just weeks after winning the award. So it's like, like apparently the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs is like keeping an eye on the MI, what the MIT students are doing. Oh, they just came out with this project. They just, you know, got an award in the, in the hackathon. We have to stop them and make sure this thing never gets out into the wild and gets popular. But like hit them yeah. with a lawsuit right away. Just totally discourage them from ever thinking about doing anything like that. It's like, aren't you doing better things that the New Jersey Division of Consumer Affairs can be <laughs> looking into? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. 
Probably not. They'd probably be better off just closing shop and going home. <laughs> go, just leave and go find something else more beneficial. Get a real to do job. For society. Yeah, provide value to the world yeah, instead of get a get a real job in the private sector. Yeah, instead of putting other people down who are actually creating interesting things with their time and their skills, you know, trying to discourage them from doing interesting stuff. It's like, why don't you go and do interesting stuff with your life? They... I didn't catch that. What was that? They can't. That's why they work for the government. No, they can't. <laughs> ah. Sh- Professional parasites. That's, a, that's America for you. There's a bunch. Of, I mean, that's that's how it is with with the criminal justice system too. A lot of the time, it's like all this this whole gigantic unwieldy system that has sprung up to you know basically try and ruin people's lives or at the very least impede them in their lives, uh, and all of that is executed by people who have n- nothing valuable in their professional lives going on themselves. So it's like, what the, come on, society, you can do better than that. Be a little bit more productive than that. Yeah. It's like, you know, a lot of cops are high school dropouts, uh, uh, former criminals. And just all around aggressive people States who want to control others. Yeah, some states actually have laws placing um, an upper limit on the IQ of their police officers. So if what? you're too in- if you're too intelligent, you can't be a police officer. Now, what the? you know, you can you can read in that however you want, but to me, that's saying we want you to be smart enough to follow orders, but not but too stupid to question what we're telling you to do. Yeah. Yeah, don't think for yourself. We don't need you to do that. We just need you to, to listen to what we're telling you to do. The FTC actually said that it did shut down Butterfly Labs, mm-hmm. like confirming the rumor. Okay. Uh, but the headline says it didn't have anything to do with Bitcoin. Oh, uh, it was about it was about the allegations of fraud. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Butterfly Labs. They're a mining company. Um, you know, they, 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 they sell mining rigs to people for Bitcoin, but the problem with them was apparently that people would pre-order the machines and not get them for many months and sometimes like a year or never get the machines at all. And then by the time they finally do get them, uh, they're obsolete, they're obsolete. They can't mine Bitcoin anymore. The hashing rate has skyrocketed. I mean, just let's look. The hashing rate in the past year has gone from one pay to hash to like about 250 pay to hashes now. And like I wrote an article about the hashing power had reached 100 pay to hashes over the summer. I believe that was, I think that was in June. And just since the summer, you know, now we're in fall, the, the hashing power has doubled again. So, like, in order, like, we talk about the com- com- competitiveness of Bitcoin mining. You know, pretty much you need the machine like right away for it to be uh, mm-hmm. usable still. And Butterfly Labs just wasn't doing that at all. So they got taken down by the FC- FTC. Not necessarily raided, um, like what was at first rumored has happened. Like a, a raid, you know, it was, well, they shut them down. Of, like a militarized operation or something. But, you know, they just went yeah, in there and like... probably took their assets and. They um, they froze their assets until a hearing that will take place on September 29th. Okay. Uh, it says the it could be it says directly from the article the 10 day restraining order could be extended during which time investigators will continue developing their case against Butterfly Labs. Okay. Yeah. Um. There's a lot of people in the community who are praising this. Basically saying, "Oh, good that you know they took out I mean, one of the main scammers in the Bitcoin economy." What yeah, a lot think? of people are, a lot of people are pissed at, at Butterfly Labs. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't really, know, I don't really know much about Butterfly Labs, so you know, like I probably you know shouldn't really have an opinion on it. Like I've heard people talk about how it's a scam before, and then I I saw like a few months ago, uh, the thing on Reddit where the creator of the Butcoin subreddit like got got paid. 
by Butterfly Labs to like you know be a shill for their products, and then uh, and then they Butterfly Labs basically like scammed that guy and like mm-hmm. somehow and like somehow he lost some money or something. I I don't know. I can't remember the story, but the, I I remember that and I thought that was funny and I was like, yeah, that's, that's what you get for hating Bitcoin. You you know you stupid skeptic. But why would they agree to get in cahoots with a crappy Bitcoin mining company anyway? If they hate Bitcoin, like yeah, did they I not don't, realize or something? I don't exactly like I don't really remember the details of the story. I just remember it was the guy who created um Buttcoin, which is like I don't know if it's like actually an anti Bitcoin thing or if it's just you you know, like a kind of like a you know lighthearted satirical like a kind of thing. Kind of thing. Yeah, like I don't, I haven't really looked into Bitcoin that much to like actually you know make a decision on that. But from what I remember the story, the the creator of the of the Bitcoin subreddit made some kind of made some kind of deal with Butterfly Labs, and they Butterfly Labs ended up scamming that guy or something. Hmm. Um, Okay, so basically, but Butterfly Labs suck all around, right? Yeah, like as far as their like, you know, their mining, their you know, mining thing goes, like, if yeah, you like if they pre-order it, and it's like you know, we'll have your, we'll have your machine to you like within thirty days of the release date, and then they wait like six months. Like yeah, that's definitely a legitimate case of uh, a possibly legitimate case of fraud because you know they made you a promise to get you your machine within a certain date and you gave them your money based on that agreement and then they didn't send it to you. But if their website had like all sales are final, no refunds, and then they didn't have any expected release date for the mining rigs, mm. you know, like. Then is it You're, kind of the consumer's fault yeah, for the putting customer, their money at the risk? The customer is responsible for taking on that risk. Like, you you win, you made the purchase, you, or you made the pre-order, knowing that you couldn't get your money back if you're if you're uh, dissatisfied, and um, knowing that there was no set release date for the product. So you know, if if you didn't if you, you didn't get your machine and something happened, uh, like you know hypothetically if they shut down and, and you paid that money and you know you never got anything out of it um you agreed to a, a final sale to buy a machine with no set release date like you're not you don't, you're not entitled to that money you know you made you made that agreement but i don't like i don't know if that was the case with butterfly labs like i don't know if they put an expected release date on their products or not or if they just like they're like yeah you buy it all sales are final, you'll get it when you get it, you know, depending on how Butterfly Labs went about it, you know, is is the deciding factor between was it, you know, fraudulent or not. Yeah, but, and like, isn't there, isn't there a lot of responsibility on the customer themselves to like do research into the company that they're buying from, especially if it's a multi-thousand dollar purchase, like, do some research on the Bitcoin forums for like other people who've, who've, you know, uh, interacted with Butterfly Labs and if they're like a legit company or not, if they're on it, true to their word, like, I don't, I don't know. Are there like review sites right now for, for mining companies? Cause there should be, there should be a review site for like mining companies and, you know, people can rate like how fast they deliver, you know, if the machines live up to their promised hash, hash rate and stuff like that. Like if that kind of resource was available, then it, it would it would be harder for people to blindly you know take risks if they know that there's a resource available to check reviews like a Yelp for you know mining yeah. mining companies. Yeah, I would say you know it's basically common sense to do research before you buy something like especially if you're gonna buy like a two thousand dollar mining rig or however much they cost. Uh, like if you're gonna lay down that much cash on something. You know, I would, you know, any normal, reasonable person would, you know, shop around a little bit. And we have all these, like, great online resources. Like, we have, like, a thriving Bitcoin community on Reddit and, and you know, several Bitcoin subreddits. Like, 
you would think that people it would just be like they wouldn't even think twice about looking something up before they spent the money on it and if like what what really is kind of funny to me like in a dark way is that people have been saying uh butterfly labs has been a scam like for a long time i'm guessing uh so yeah. why are they still making money <laughs> Like it's yeah. it's a it's kind of a well known fact or a well known assumption rather that um, this company is a scam, and yet they're still making millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, you know that's they not, must have been still not, making money up until the FTC shut them yeah, down. Yeah, you know that's not really um, Butterfly Labs' fault. That's fault of the stupid people who gave them money knowing that there was a good chance there it was a scam they're like oh i heard about this bitcoin <laughs> thing i can get rich mining bitcoins i'll just i'll just buy a mining rig from the first company that i come across yeah like or because i like so, their name or something there's like several other companies that have an established reputation of giving you what you pay for on time so you know you have all these options why wouldn't you do research you know, like, uh, people kind of have to, you know, blame yeah. themselves a little bit in this situation, except that, you know, that might have just been a little bit stupid. It's not all Butterfly Lab's fault. Right, right. Yeah, it's if if you do research and you find out who's trustworthy and who's not, it reminds me of, you know, the whole Mount Gox situation a year ago. Like, there were signs that Mount Gox had serious problems, um like at least six months before it finally blew up and shut down. Like people having withdrawal delays um, with for both fiat or bitcoins and, you know, all kinds of, you know, basically non-existent customer support. It's like, I understand if that's like the only option in in the whole space for like exchanging bitcoins. But like at a certain point, it, you have to realize that like, why would anyone hold Bitcoins there if there's so many problems with withdrawals and everything? Like, don't hold your Bitcoins on a place that it, that it has so many problems and is, you know, this is the wild, wild west out here. Uh, you got you to gotta do your research and do research in the companies because they will screw you over. Um, either not necessarily out of malice, but maybe just total incompetence or, or greed or there's a whole host of reasons. And, uh, like, if someone starts kind of doing shady stuff, then don't use them anymore. And, and mitigate your own risk of being associated with them. Like, there, there, like, so many people back then held Bitcoins on Mt. Gox, even though there were so many problems for six months. Like, just, I, I guess, it, you know, just because this is a highly, like, technical um, space and, like, you have to be relatively educated to, um, you know, kind of understand what, bitcoins are and, and and things like that like it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is like well versed enough in like researching uh you know whether companies are reputable or not you know so butterfly labs latest latest death and failure of a prominent um prominent bitcoin entity and like if you if you pay attention to the space and 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 at least do some research once in a while, you can find out like the companies that are kind of on a downward traje trajectory and are not providing you know the the promised services to their customers, and in, in some cases maybe all out fraud. Who knows? That'll get hashed out in court, right? Um, yep. But they were untrustworthy, not worth it to deal with, and. Um, been shady for a long time from what i understand yeah way you know way back last year people were complaining about shipping delays from butterfly labs so you know goodbye butterfly labs and i guess the the space appears a little bit more legitimate now you know with such a scam artist taken out of the picture and you know that that might have um been a factor as well in the in the little bit of a price hike we had a few days ago by 50 bucks, you know. People celebrating about Butterfly Labs going under. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe some celebrating, but also, like, you know, you, you mentioned earlier as well, like, um, when the space seems more legitimate, uh, then investors jump in. You know, um, the PayPal thing illegitimizes it. 
um, you know, going back to examples from last year, after Silk Road was taken down, some investors saw that as a sign that it was more legitimate because the, the black market, you know, was no longer a factor in it. And, and now, now basically the worst mining company in the whole space has been shut down, their assets frozen, and they're going to be tried in court for, you know, for fraud. So, like, it's almost like, um, you know, law enforcement agencies in the government are actually participating in the space by taking out, um, taking out services and companies that they deem, uh, you know, ineffective, you know, fraudulent and, and things like that, or just, you know, passing judgment about like what they think is legal or not. Um, so, you know, which is one of the very few things government, you know, is, has a legitimate authority to do is protect against fraud, persecute mm -hmm. criminals, thieves. Yeah, so. yeah, and and violence especially as well. Like, yeah, I wish the government would prosecute more instances of violence in society, especially violence perpetrated by their own ranks, in the form of the cops and police force. But that's that's yeah. a whole other can of worms, that uh that is for. Um, a different time. Huobi accidentally sends over 900 bitcoins to the wrong people. What? I didn't see yeah. that. Happened on Wednesday evening. Um, the company's customer service wrongly sent 920 bitcoins and 8,100 litecoins to 27 users. That's around... Four hundred thousand dollars in bitcoins and thirty six thousand in Litecoin. Damn, to, they sent that to to random users of the service, like people who use o, uh, Huobi, and like all of a sudden they get yeah, like an extra like, balance of of bitcoins and Litecoins in their account. Like um, the article I'm reading doesn't really say much. It's like a two hundred word article, but um, I'm guessing. I'm guessing they just like, you know, customer service was handling, so they might have been like handing out refunds or processing withdrawals or something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, typed in the wrong address and sent it to the wrong person. <laughs> okay. Damn, that's, um, that's kind of they, a fuck up right there. The, uh, most of the funds were returned to Huobi by the people who they were accidentally sent to, oh, uh, wow. but some but some are still missing, and uh, they Huobi. This article also says that Huobi um, temporarily halted withdrawals once they found out what they did, um, but then they you know resumed them later on. So. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, I guess exchanges. Go Man, you got to be careful. Don't want to send yeah. free money to people who is not theirs. Like, yep. and and I guess if if they they did ex recover most of it, but even if they had lost it, like I would hope that um, Huobi, you know, wouldn't take that money from other users' accounts. Like they would just take it as a loss for their company. Like, oh crap, yeah. we fucked up. Uh, we ain't gonna see this money back. Um, I mean, they can afford it. They have like what 103 percent reserve ratio. So there you go. They have everybody's go. money and then some. But yeah, they um, they're updating their system or whatever to like double check to make sure like they're processing everything right uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. 920 bitcoins. That was like that one dude on Reddit who accidentally sent 800 bitcoins to Mount Gox. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, bitcoins. Like, in in this space, like, if you make one, like, small mistake, you can just paste, like, the wrong address somewhere and um, and send, send money. And then you send it, and boom, you ain't... It's gone. You ain't getting it back. It's like it's like whoosh, just send cash out the window to you know a pigeon flying cash. <laughs> That's why I, I always double check when I'm sending Bitcoin somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then there's oh there's like malware now that makes it possible yeah. to like paste in someone else's address to your yep. to your client. So 
Got to be careful. Got to be careful. Got to learn about all the security vulnerabilities and stuff and, and guard against it. And, like, it's real money. You got to treat it like money. And treat it like real cash. Because, you know, the, the um, protections aren't built into the system itself. At least not yet. Yep. So it's on the onus of the user to be careful. That is what's so great about the free market, though, if you ask me. You know, like, it encourages intelligence and responsibility and punishes laziness, unwarranted laziness and... Uh, Willful ignorance. Just makes, yeah, it just makes you pay attention to things. It makes you have more control over your own life. Tim Draper is still saying Bitcoin will be $10,000 within three years. Of course he is. Good luck with that. <laughs> he owns millions of Bitcoins. No. <laughs> is it millions or is it just millions of dollars in Bitcoin? I think... It... Um, yeah, yeah. He he owns about 3,000 Bitcoins that he bought from the U.S. government. Which... Yeah, $18 million. At the, oh, at the time. At the time. At the time. That's so now, probably a little bit less now. Yeah, now it's... Still over ten million dollars, um, but yeah, he wants to see that ten million turn into a billion dollars. So of course he's gonna say it's gonna be ten thousand dollars. Like, yeah, it's in his self-interest. I would be, I would, I would like to see Tim Draper. I don't know, maybe he does have a blog or something, but I would like to see him write, um, you know, well-reasoned arguments and cases for where he thinks Bitcoin is going and why. It'll be ten thousand dollars because you know everyone involved in the space wants it to go to ten thousand. The hard part is justifying that price, um, mm -hmm. you know, with convincing arguments, and not only justifying it but like trying to imagine like a roadmap uh, for how the currency can evolve and become that valuable and and make the case for why people would want to buy it because people. We'll, we'll make the argument like, oh, if, if you there's only so many Bitcoins and if you divide it among the whole world, then the price is like skyrockets to this, you know, this crazy amount. But, you know, to get <laughs> to that just, point... That assumes people actually want them. Yeah, yeah. It assumes people actually want them and want to pay, you know, money for them out of their current financial system that they have going for themselves that, you know, in the case of the U.S. might include bank accounts, credit cards, loans, all that all that stuff is like why would they want to own bitcoin and put a sizable amount of wealth into bitcoin? You can't force people to use it. Um you can give it away for free and hope that they use it. That's what they're <laughs> going to do in uh Dominica. But you can't force people to use it and you can use all the theoretical, you know, all the theoretical, you know, math calculations you want based on the population of the world to see how you know how much it'll be worth but yeah just because just because there's less bitcoin less bitcoins than there are people doesn't mean uh bitcoin is going to be super valuable like value comes from uh value comes from people like actually wanting it not just from the fact that it exists and then there's less of it than there are people in the world so you know that even that argument you could say oh well there's like 7 billion people and 22 million bitcoins or something or however many it is so yeah w once everybody wants bitcoin then it's going to be super valuable well everybody has to want bitcoin first and now yeah. we're returning now we're back at the argument of how do we make people want bitcoin and we have to make major improvements before we reach that stage so yeah. you know like i personally I think, I mean, I could see Bitcoin being worth, you know, one Bitcoin being worth like a million dollars, like maybe 30 years from now. Like mm -hmm. in on the long run, I'm extremely bullish on Bitcoin, but it going like way lower than it actually is because there's just no reason for it to go up right now. There's no buying pressure. Well, I mean, there's yeah, buying like pressure, getting... but not as much as people... Uh, would like or anticipate yeah like it's getting much easier to spend now so people are like it's getting much easier to spend and um you know there are actually jobs that pay in bitcoin now 
So, you know, there's some portion of the community that's actually starting to use it like a currency instead of, you know, like gold, some like a, you yeah. know, investment like speculation this asset vehicle. thing that, that, I, that I have that fluctuates in value. They're actually yeah. using it to buy stuff and also earn it for their labor. So, yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. So, you know, people are actually using it as a currency. Um, you know, businesses still can't pay their suppliers in Bitcoin. So that right there creates a bunch of selling pressure. And uh, there is no, like, there's no significant advances happening within the protocol itself to fix its problems. Uh, which kind of makes it less attractive, you know, like, oh, what are these problems with Bitcoin? What's being done about it? Oh, well, nothing, because, you know, the one organization that has given itself the responsibility to improve Bitcoin's protocol is spending all their money on uh, governments. So, yeah, yeah nothing, nothing's really happening on that front. Oh, well, It's kind of stagnant yeah, right now. Yeah, well, um, that sounds like I don't want it then, so... It's just, yeah. you know, people are getting rid of their Bitcoins faster than, you know, other people are buying it. So I so see it going down. The value goes down, yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I see it going down a lot further. But yeah. that's, not a bad, that's not a bad thing, though. Like, everybody's like, oh, if the, if the price goes to 100, then Bitcoin's over. Well, no. Like, yeah, no, no. Bitcoin was doing thousand, fine when it was a hundred before. Yeah, the the price was at a thousand a couple months ago. And now it's at four hundred. Does that mean it's like, you know, that much, like less revolutionary? I mean, does that mean it works any different? No. Yeah, yeah. Like, the price going down is not a bad thing in all cases. Sometimes, yeah. the price is just, you know, over Maybe Bitcoin is just overvalued and it needs to go down. It's just a, my take on it yeah um it's bad for people who um who bought a lot of bitcoins and they see it as an investment and they also watch the price frequently so it's it's bad for them because like they they bought into this expecting to treat it as this investment vehicle as an asset and it's really being used primarily as a currency um and like they, no, and if they watch the price and that's as. pretty stressful yeah, yeah. so it's <laughs> like it, and the lesson is you know if you first of all i i don't recommend seeing it as an investment you like you get the usefulness out of it instead of just buying it and letting it sit use it use it as a currency pay, pay for things with it but also earn it and also, you know, buy it with like, you know, spare money that, that you might have that you wouldn't necessarily mind um, seeing go down in value a little bit. You know, take 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 a risk with uh, with a little bit of your assets. But um, like, but you know, I can I I kind of I I can sympathize with those people who are like crazy who who think the world is ending when the Bitcoin price goes down because. Um, I think you have a, like a, a slightly different perspective on it because we have the luxury of actually getting paid in Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, we don't actually have to put any pre-existing wealth into Bitcoin in order to have it. You know, um, we just have to do our jobs. And but most people, most people don't have that luxury because you know Bitcoin jobs just aren't really a thing right now. Like they're they're it's growing. You know, it's a growing industry but you know it's it's not mainstream. not big enough yeah it's not big enough for everybody to have a bitcoin job so you have to put some most people majority of people have to put some of their existing wealth into it um so you from that perspective it makes sense because there's just there's no reason to spend your bitcoin if it's worth less than it was when you bought it because then you're effectively um losing wealth you know cuz you you bought a hundred dollars for like uh point two bitcoin um and then you use that to buy you know fifty dollars you know well you just threw fifty dollars in the trash can you know so uh, yeah i can like i can kind of sympathize with them but yeah I, it, it it must be kind of painful right for the people who 
bought in earlier this year when the, like at the beginning of the year when the price was at like 700 to 800 and like there was a lot of hype going on at the time and then to just see the price kind of kind of just flounder and stay stagnant um drop to around like 400 um in early spring then there was a spike in late may to uh the over the 600 range and then from there slow slow steady uh downward towards 400 again and at this moment $402 on uh Bitstamp exchange so uh and and it could go much lower like don't like if if you're going to if you're going to buy bitcoins and see it as an investment like try not to watch the price too much like maybe maybe watch the news relating to it instead of the price um yep. if you want to reduce your stress a little bit especially if you have you know thousands upon thousands of dollars um or hundreds of thousands of dollars maybe even millions if you're Tim Draper like <laughs> Uh, man, like I, I, I hope he's successful though. Like, regardless of what the Bitcoin value is, he's gonna do some pretty interesting stuff with all that money. Um, in terms of like, uh, foreign countries and promoting remittances between countries, and you know, getting to the world's unbanked population, and there's huge potential there, um, for improving people's lives, uh, using the technology, and not having to go through regular banks and financial institutions um like there's a lot of potential there and tim draper's you know best of luck to him so yeah uh, gavin andreessen has actually started work on invertible bloom lookup tables for the bitcoin I, core protocol i saw that on reddit like i saw that that thread title and I remembered a tweet he made like a couple months ago about that. And I was like, what the hell did he just say? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to read that because I'm just not even going to understand it. Yeah. Um, someone made a pretty decent explanation in the Reddit comments. I'll just, I'll just, I'll, I'll quote them directly. Um, this is inappropriate cliche talking. Uh, he says that, there's currently an incentive for miners to keep blocks small because smaller found blocks can be transmitted around the network faster than large blocks, thus increasing the chance that a miner can claim the prize for their found block. So like Bitcoin mining, it's, it's a race, and whoever gets the block first gets the, the Bitcoin's reward. So Gavin's solution would make all found block announcements a fixed size blob removing the small size incentive. This in turn would likely mean miners would want to include more transactions in their blocks to collect more transaction fees. So it's basically kind of removing the the small size incentive and um, theoretically it should make mining um, more efficient uh, and also include more transactions in the block and you wouldn't, like, if I'm reading this correctly, you wouldn't need to wait as long um, necessarily uh, for confirmations to happen. Especially if you're, uh, if you're, if you didn't attach a, transa- a transaction fee to your, to your payment, um, the miners will include you anyway because they're getting more transaction fees in general, and they don't care like how big the block is anymore they don't have to make it small anymore so seems like a seems like an improvement and gavin's getting to work on this improving the core protocol good job you know justifying the salary that the bitcoin foundation pays him and uh you know (laughs) like bitcoin is still in beta technically it's still a 0.9 version so work that needs to be done getting done good stuff yep Sounds pretty interesting. Like, you know, I have, like, I would have no idea what any of it meant, but, you know, if it makes mining better, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the system isn't perfect. It needs, you know, there are, there are improvements that can be made. Um, so, here's, here's another person that gives a, 
gives an explanation. Um, this is the problem, according to them. This is cyber uh, numismatist. Bitcoin miners want their newly found blocks to propagate across the network as quickly as possible because every millisecond of delay increases the chances that another block found at the same time wins the block race. With today's P2P protocol, this gives miners an incentive to limit the number of transactions included in their blocks. A transaction must pay more fees to the miner than they are statistically likely to lose due to the increased chance of losing a block race. Since new block announcements include all of the data for all of the transactions in the block. This is inefficient. Transaction data is transmitted across the network twice, including twice as much bandwidth, and artificially increases transaction fees to be much higher than they need to be. So, too long didn't read. I'm not risking my reward to in order to transmit your transactions. So, um... Yeah, like I, 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 there are reports sometimes of people's transactions not going through at all, especially if they don't attach a fee to it. So uh, this is this is hopefully gonna um, prevent that, and and make just the payment network work better. Which is what you know, this is what, that no, it's it's not really a surprise that the Bitcoin Foundation is paying Gavin to um, work on this as like a primary goal, right? Because this needs to work if. Bitcoin is going to be um, a really good payment protocol, uh, which is what the foundation kind of touts it as, right? They, yeah. It's a good payment protocol for consumers to use and making payments and stuff like that. So, um, pretty, I, it's it's a good development overall. I I, I like it. Um, and uh, Gavin's a, Gavin's a pretty smart guy, and this is seems like something this has been kind of. This has been a problem that they've been aware of for for a really long time now, and um, kind of interesting that they're barely getting around to it right now. But uh, I'm glad they are. I'm glad they are getting to it now. If it, if it took them that long to get to it, then man, and, uh, mining centralization. Yeah, that'll probably be on the on their plates for for a while longer before they get to that as well. Danish government invests in Bitcoin company, uh, Coinify. They're going to focus on extending their buying and selling services to consumers and processing services to merchants. Uh, it allows... This is what the article um, Coinify allows businesses to accept Bitcoin and receive next day settlement in euros, dollars, and kroner, among other currencies. So I guess that would like get rid of you know like how on Coinbase when you cash out your Bitcoin you have to wait like four days. Oh, this you yeah. can this you can do it you know next day. And also from the article, uh, Coinify also provides a plugin for popular merchant-facing e-commerce platforms that will allow merchants that already use Big Commerce, Magneto, Shopify, and WooCommerce, which are you know, payment platforms, I'm guessing, huh. to integrate Bitcoin payments. So if anybody uses those already, um, they'll just automatically be able to accept Bitcoin. Wow, nice. So they're kind of um, trying to become the BitPay slash Coinbase of Europe. Europe. Yeah. Just that is, you know, pretty much, I'd say, you know, that's what Europe needs. Like, uh, they need, I mean, ideally, it would just like overnight become a Bitcoin economy, but obviously that's not going to happen. So it has to be, you know, European businesses have to have a way to easily convert their uh, Bitcoin to fiat so they can pay overhead, things like that. Just like American businesses need, uh, you know, BitPay and Coinbase provide that service. And so now Coinify can provide that for European businesses and you know potentially provide a better with this next day um settlement thing um and that would be really good for bitcoin in europe because you know over the summer the european banking authority told businesses not to accept until they you know like completely locked it down with regulations 
but you know this could possibly uh, provide them with an opportunity, businesses with an opportunity to just um, accept it anyways and show that it doesn't really need um, expansive regulations to to work. Like, well, Quantify makes it really easy, so you know I'm just gonna do it. I don't care what the banking authority says because you know it's an easy way to uh, get payment for my products. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know if they do any fees or anything, but if they want to remain, um, you know, competitive against the likes of Coinbase, who also recently expanded to Europe, um, then you know they would not do fees and make it really, really attractive to merchants to adopt them. Uh, no, you know, no fees, you know, what is it? Sa same day, uh, deposit of funds, you know, fiat funds. Um, they get a brand new source of revenue from Bitcoiners and just great, great for business overall. Um, as far as I can tell, they aren't, uh, you know, selling Bitcoin. Um, to consumers, they're just gonna help marketplaces and merchants accept it in Europe. So yeah, that that is a service that needs to well, be needs to be. I built. mean, this, I don't. All I know about it is from this CoinDesk article, but the art, the CoinDesk article says that it will um, focus on extending its buy and sell services to consumers, as well as. Um, Serving as a, a payment processor for merchants. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, very nice. Yeah, I see that now. Um, merchants can also log into their accounts via Facebook, a feature that is not ex extended to those buying and selling on the platform. So they are going to allow buying. Um, wow, that's pretty big. I, I haven't done much research on the Coinify um, yeah. before now, but, but it looks like they're just doing, from this. They make progress. This article, you know, it seems like a pretty cool little thing. Yeah, and they apparently get a bunch of money from Denmark's government seed capital. <laughs> wow. Yeah, making making inroads in Europe, good good stuff. Um, man, it's almost like Europe Europe might surpass America in terms of um, Bitcoin uh, like innovation. Um, well, I mean, they already have access to debit cards, so, you know, they got us there. Thanks, yeah. Zappo. Yeah. Well, thanks, well, stupid I mean, it's, it's financial the regulations in the United fall, States. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, Coinbase and BitPay have been ex allowing merchants in the United States to accept Bitcoin now for, you know, over a year, basically. A um, couple years, in a lot of cases. Uh, but like, like it's it's hard for businesses to to get a foothold, you know, um, especially with potentially new regulations on the horizon, like the bit license. Uh, we're coming up pretty pretty close to the to the bit license comment deadline, and then you know they're probably going to take away some of the more extreme provisions of the license, and then enact it anyway, regardless of you know the negative impact it might have on small startups and you know just people who want to innovate and experiment in the space so it's like uh um you don't you don't see a bit license happening in europe at least not yet um but you know it's 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 a it's a it's a tough journey you know it's a tough journey to get to get digital currency implemented into economies um especially ones that are you know regulation happy like in the united states so yep it's progress though so yeah everyone thanks for listening to the coin brief podcast episode number 17 make sure to um like the video and subscribe to our channel to get all future updates uh this has been your open source for digital currency news and uh, we'll be we'll be back next week with some more content also make you know make sure to check out the individual individualized videos as well on the channel um you know uh, follow us on twitter um at crypto sean at evan faggart and um you know make sure to uh you know keep keep working in the space as well don't just listen to us uh spout off our, our opinions um you know 
comment. We don't or, really we don't really know that much, anyways. So. Yeah, yeah, and there's <laughs> we 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 have our own shortcomings and knowledge, so make sure to comment and add your own input to it. Um, correct us if we're wrong, or if we have just flat out, you know, bad perspective or something. Correct us in the comments. Um, and also, you know, in, in in your own personal professional lives, keep keep working, improve the cryptocurrency space. Uh, this is a this is a huge financial and technical revolution that we're all a part of, and um, it's it's only going to grow if people make it grow. So, best of luck to everyone out there working to um, expand this revolution into greater and greater facets of the economy and the industry so we're changing the world out there one bit at a time <laughs> anyway uh catch you guys next week this has been the coin Brief podcast episode number 17 and uh see you guys later